Hello, my loves, and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds. That's something we've spoken about a lot on this channel on various different video series in discussion with people like Kit Power, Jack Graham, uh, Roan B. Fortune, Lex Jones, and myriad, myriad, myriad others is the place of narrative in culture, what narrative actually is. And it's an interesting thing because people find it generally the general populace certainly here in the uk find it difficult to define what narrative is they tend to immediately think of stories of storybooks things that are contained to film to media to cinema they certainly don't generally consider the impact of narrative on their own lives and their own perspectives they wouldn't even conceive of what you mean for the most part when you explain to them that their lives, their sense of self, their identities, their beliefs, their value structures are all informed by narrative. Um, that wouldn't make any sense to them, even though they exhibit it with every every day, with everything they do, everything they proclaim, everything they purport to believe in. You know, these are generally people who will go to the local shop and they will pick up whatever tabloid or newspaper or whatever suits their their own particular narratives you know the ones that they have been buying their entire lives maybe because their parents bought them and that habit was inherited or maybe because the newspapers in question feed that particular you know that strange sort of reinforcement that you get when your own narratives are legitimized that's certainly the way it works for um the right wing here in the uk and i know i know we go on about this a lot on this channel sorry you're gonna get it a lot because we are the overton window certainly here in the uk has shifted so far to the right now that we are literally getting rhetoric that's lifted directly from 1930s germany in our day-to-day -day discourse um it is really quite frightening especially for those of us who are members of particular minorities who you know historically do not fare well when right-wing forces take over we have come to the point now where things that would not have been countenanced when i was in my 20s when i was a teenager when i was even when i was a kid in the 90 the, the early 1990s are now part of mainstream rhetoric and People generally don't understand the place of narrative in that phenomena. So what has happened here in the UK is that certain very insidious forces that are much bigger and more profound than most people will ever understand have slowly drip-fed little corrosive narratives, poisonous little drops of narrative into our discourses over a period of decades. Um, you can you can see this if you go and research things like, for example, the front pages of the Daily Mail, the Sun, any of the right-wing tabloids over the last two decades. You will see the drip feed that has slowly corroded the status quo, that has slowly poisoned perspective here in the UK, and has made narratives that are entire bullshit, they are made out of whole cloth, they actually have no basis in reality at all, be part of mainstream discussion and mainstream assumption and even political discourse. These things are now even informing political policy. I mean, Brexit is probably the most damning example of this. Brexit is unambiguously, regardless of what your politics is now, if, unless, if you can't accept that it was a complete fucking disaster, then there's no hope for you. You, you, you don't get a place at the adult table, quite frankly, because you only have to step outside your door and you can see the effects, you can see the results, you can go down to your local supermarket or your local corner shop and you will see the effects of Brexit on the shelves. You can go and read your fucking electricity meter and you can see the effects of Brexit. Um, if you can't accept now that it, it was a complete disaster for anyone who is not already a billionaire, for anyone who is not already rich and was not predetermined to make money from it, then you are what I'm talking about. Ironically, you are a symptom of this very sickness. Brexit was the very coalescence of these narratives, of these right-wing narratives, that 
are based in absolutely nothing but scapegoating paranoia. They are based in absolutely nothing. There is no legitimate concern or fear that came out of Brexit at all. It was an entire mass delusion fed by the narratives of the right. And interestingly, it's when you look at the demographics that it affected that it's the most interesting. Because if you look at the breakdown of demographics for the people who voted for Brexit, the vast, vast majority of them were my parents' generation the baby boomers, as per fucking usual, right? If you look at the generations after them, the millennials, uh, the latter half of Generation X, uh, and some of uh, Generation Z, they almost universally voted to remain. Almost universally voted to remain. A a great many of us, by the way, abstained completely because our... Our experience of these systems is not good. It's not positive. It's why the vast majority of my generation and the generations below us don't vote at all in comparison to our parents and their parents and their parents because we have no faith in the systems anymore. We are able to see in ways that our parents and our grandparents are not the narrative surrounding these systems and how they are complete garbage. They are complete bullshit. We've been stung too many times. I mean, we actually kind of got our way in the mid to late 90s when we actually managed to get a Labour government in and then of course it turned out to be New Labour, Tony Blair's New Labour, which was nothing but a Tory party wearing red, right? Um, It was just a Tory party that acted like a Tory party whose policies were almost entirely Tory that began many of the degradations, or rather escalated many of the degradations and dissolutions that we're now facing, that are now coming to a head, by the way. Um, And again, all of this, all of this is down to this drip feed of narrative into culture. Um, It really is this simple. The right, the forces of the right in this country, and in, in general, have no policies. They have nothing. They, they, they sincerely have no concrete ideas and nothing that they can actually market to the general populace, not in sincerity. Because if they were sincere, they would have to say, yes, we believe in traditional divisions in privilege. We believe that the rich should, should stay rich and get richer, while the poor should stay poor and get poorer. We believe that people who are not of particular social classes and status by birth deserve to get sick, not be treated, and die. We believe that. We also believe that anyone who does not meet our criteria for what is human should be ostracised, evicted from society to the point whereby they hopefully crawl away and die conveniently. That's what they'd have to say. So what the right does universally, and this is from, you can look into examples in recent history and like far, far, far back into history for this. McCarthyism in the US was this. The um, the the satanic panic in the 1980s was this. The, the scares, the, the various narratives regarding homosexuals and LGBTQ people from the religious right are this. They have nothing to offer, so they have to err on the side of narrative. They have to err on the side of aesthetics. It's all they have. And they have to be divisive rhetorics. They have to be divisive narratives. It has to be distractionary and scapegoating. It has to be, look over here, look over here, look over here. Don't look over here where we don't want you to look, because then you'll see all of the abuses, the hypocrisies, and you'll also see the face of your actual enemy. And the actual enemy are the forces that, they are the forces of enshrined privilege and of maintaining a corrupt status quo based on sick traditions basically the the face of your enemy are it's the billionaires effectively it's the people making money and maintaining their status and their influence based on the divisions that they sow based on these narratives that they seep into culture uh, you have nothing in common with them they may as well you know sort of david ike's narrative that like they're all aliens they're all reptilians the sad thing about that is were it not for the fact that david ike is a fucking lunatic and an anti-semitic nutcase were it not for the fact that it's marketed as literal it would actually be a really fucking good metaphor for the reality of the situation i mean we've got the situation here in the uk and this demonstrates 
magistrates, the the, the abyssal divisions between the generations, by the way. We have the status quo with the royal family. Like, our parents' generation, they were part of that mass hysteria that occurred recently when Queen Elizabeth died, where they were mourning and they were sort of, and there was all this ridiculous pageantry and whatnot. My generation, by and large, and the generations that came after us were sort of like, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is insane. She wouldn't have stopped to piss on you were you ablaze, okay? She was part of a class that is symbolic and emblematic of your degradation, of your oppression. They are they are a bunch of privileged, born to privilege, warmongers, landowners, and bastards. They they are some of the most corrupt people on earth, you know? And you are here worshipping them, licking the boots, because that's the narrative that's been fed to you. you. And you haven't been given the means to question it. And the funny thing is, because those narratives, the, the, the nature of these narratives is that they are parasitic. They seep in like brain worms, and they rearrange the topography of people's minds. They become parasitically part of that person's identity. So then any attack on the narrative becomes an attack on the person, right? It becomes taken as a personal attack. It's the way these ideologies work. A a really good example of this is Graham Linehan. Graham Linehan, who was... When I was a kid in the early 1990s, hailed as a comedic genius, he is the writer of Father Ted, one of the, and it still is sadly one of the greatest comedies that's come out of this culture. It's brilliant, it's utterly brilliant, but has gone so far down into the the vortex of the the anti-trans narratives that there's nothing else left of him. He's actually sacrificed everything of who he is, his identity, his relationships, his profession, his career, his imagination. Everything has been ripped away from him because he can't divorce himself from these assumptions. He is crazy, this man. He has lost everything as a result of this. His family, his daughter, his wife and daughter will have nothing to do with him because he's such an extreme reactionary. Anyone in the entertainment industry that he once was part of have distanced themselves from him completely. And now he's at the very bottom. He is circling the drain. He's circling the abyss. And he is one of the best examples, excuse Excuse me, I think, of what poisonous, corrosive narrative can do to a person. The way that it eats away everything else. He does nothing but harass people on Twitter. That's all he does. He has nothing left of his personality. And you have these forces that have vested political interest goading him on, feeding him, you know, uh, actually funding him, funding this self-destructive corrosive lifestyle this identity i would not be surprised to wake up one morning very soon and find that one of two scenarios he'll he'll have either done away with himself which would not surprise me at all or arguably the worst option he will have been part of something really terrible He'll have done something really terrible. He'll have influenced something really terrible directly. It will be something like that. That's how extreme he has become. Uh, His rhetoric as it stands is just nothing. It is nothing but the shrill shrieking of a man whose mind has become demented. a A mind that's been eaten away by parasitic narratives. And that's where we are in the UK at the moment. Narrative is everything. It's got to the point whereby... You've got working class people who are suffering immensely because of things like Brexit, because of 10, 12 years of Toryism and of the defunding of public institutions, the uh, basically removal of any restrictions that fucking businesses and companies have to basically carte blanche do whatever they like to the fucking country, including pumping raw shit and sewage into our rivers, you know. Um, We are suffering because of that, but you will still get a whole swathes of working class people who will vote Tory, who will support the Tories, who will, you know, call for the re-election of Boris Johnson and whatnot. And they don't, and it's all because of narrative. Narrative is a for, is in many respects a form of dementia. It's like a virus or a parasite that seeps poison into people's minds to the point whereby what is overt and evident, it can be marketed as though it's some kind of extremist delusion. 
and that is really insane. We saw it with Jeremy Corbyn. Now, don't get me wrong, I have I had issues with Corbyn, but I was behind him. He was one of the last the last good people in politics. That's absolutely true. Had massive issues with him, but generally speaking, he was one of the last decent people in politics. And the narratives that the forces arrayed against him came up with were completely bullshit. They were so insane and bonkers. You didn't even have to do very much research to see that they were insane and bullshit but they became part of mainstream narrative because they were repeated and repeated and repeated and flung at us from so many different angles and from so many different platforms all of which are part of this vast fucking structure of fungal corruption by the way that believes that tradition and the corrupt status quo is better than any change any systemic alteration or shift that's the big thing that's the big thing these structures and the people that parasitically rely upon them are reliant upon the maintenance of the status quo they can't allow for the assumption that there are systemic problems that there, it, it is not some bad apples it is not some aberration with the system but the system itself because if that were the case a lot of these institutions would have to be torn down the bbc is a really good example we it should have already been torn down in any sane society after jimmy savile after what we know about that that should have been it that should have been the end but no the the corruption goes on and on and on and on to the point whereby nowadays it has become basically one of the uh, de jure platforms for the transphobic narratives which are currently flooding our culture and again this is a really good example of what the right does and what it relies upon they can't win on policy they can't win on any kind of futurist vision because they don't have one beyond what we already have the current status quo of corruption and division that's all they want that's all they can have so they need something else they need to they need to pump a new poison into culture they need to have a new scapegoat they need to have a new enemy and at the moment in the uk it's trans people and immigrants but it, it's amazing to me that anyone who even has like a cursory, like a high school understanding of history can't see this pattern. It's amazing to me. And again, I feel, I'm really sorry about this, but it's largely our parents' generation and, and those before that suffer with this blindness. They seem to have this problem where they can't identify narrative. They, can't, they don't even have like the language or the instruments in order to do it. They will buy the newspapers, they will listen to the BBC, they will watch news reports and they think that it's fucking real they think that this is just a, a relay of facts they don't understand that this information has been passed and it has been edited and it's been framed in a very particular way to push agenda to actually to impose and enshrine particular narratives that d wouldn't even occur to them it wouldn't even occur to the vast majority of them but it does occur to us and I think the reason it does occur to us is because, by and large, we are much less comfortable than they are. By and large, we have less. We are less invested in those systems as a result. And therefore, we are willing to question them to a much deeper and greater degree. Now, things are going to change, and that's why the, the current narratives are so shrill, so extreme. What you're seeing is conservative movements realising they're fucked within a generation they're going to be done because people are not going to be buying it people are not going to be supporting them if you look at the generations in this country that are at school now for example that are say in high school they all have lgbtq friends transgender friends they have friends who have uh you know a mum and dad who are from different ethnic backgrounds and to them it's like what the fuck who cares who gives a shit you know that is escalating and it's that that the right is reacting against because they know it's death to them they know that they are done they are 
done, 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 done. Which is why they are moving towards the only thing they can, which is fascism. I know that word is overused, but I mean that in the literal sense, not in some hyperbolic way. I mean that in the sense that Hannah Arendt would use it. That's what they're moving towards. Here in the UK, we now have voter suppression. We have the bringing in of photo IDs if you want to vote. There's no voter fraud in the UK. There's never been any voter fraud in the UK. And the only times we have seen problems with the voting system is in Tory-led councils as a result of corruption from the fucking Tories. Here's a really good example of the narrative that I'm talking about. There are these things, for those who don't know, there are these things in, in London called Oyster Cards. And Oyster cards are basically travel credit cards. They, you put a certain amount of money on them and you can travel around London on almost any form of transport you desire just by flicking your card. And they also function as photo ID. However, they've established that people over 60 who have an Oyster card can use that at the voting booth now. But people, young people, people under, I think it's under 20, can't. I mean, that is flagrant. That is absolutely flagrant. That is voter suppression. They know that older people generally vote Tory and generally vote Conservative, and younger people don't. So you've got the same form of ID where one demographic is being actively suppressed and one is not. It's fucking disgusting. It's fucking disgusting. And it's about time we got really fucking angry about it. And no, going to the voting booth is not going to help because we currently have no left wing in mainstream politics in the UK. We have no alternative. We are going to have to organise, my loves, and do it fucking soon.